Welcome to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio, bringing you insights and strategies to help you create a magnificent and fulfilling second half of life. Here's your host, certified professional retirement coach and best-selling author, Dr. Dorian Mincer. I want to welcome everybody to my Revolutionize Your Retirement interview with Expert series. I'm Dory Mincer, owner of Revolutionized Retirement and your host for the call. So without further ado, I want to introduce my guest and get started with the call. So I met, so my guest is Kathleen Burns Kingsbury. She's a wealth psychology expert, founder of KBK Wealth Connection, host of Breaking Money Silence podcast, and an internationally published author and speaker. Her recent book is Breaking Money Silence, How to Shatter Money Taboos, Talk Openly About Finances, and Live a Richer Life. This is her fifth book. Her other books include How to Give Financial Advice to Women, Creating Wealth from the Inside Out, How to Give Financial Advice to Couples, and her prior interest, which uh, you know does have some relationship with some of the dynamics and issues, was about weight wisdom, affirmations to free you from food and body concerns. Lean is a sought-after speaker, consultant on the topic of women and wealth and couples and money. Her mission is to empower women, couples, and families and the advisors who work with them to shatter money taboos and communicate more effectively about financial matters. She's an expert in financial psychology, and she's been quoted in publications such as the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Money Magazine, Today Money, and Forbes Woman. Her articles have appeared in American Banker Magazine, CNBC, Investment News, and other trade and consumer magazines. Kathleen's an adjunct lecturer at the McCallum Graduate School of Business at Bentley University and a guest lecturer at the Personal Finance Plan Program at Test. Texas Tech University. She received an undergraduate degree in finance from Providence College and started her career in retail banking before becoming a commissioned bank examiner with the FDIC. Due to her desire to coach executive management on improving performance, she attained a master's degree in psychology, became a certified professional co-active coach, and founded her consulting firm, KBK Wealth Connection. When not working, Kathleen is an avid alpine skier who lives for the next powder day. And in the off-season, she enjoys mountain biking, kayaking, and laughing with her friends. She lives with her husband and her cat, Avery, in the Mad River Valley of Vermont. So I am so delighted to have you here today, Kathleen. And just to mention, Kathleen and I met a a few, a number of years ago, really. I think it might be oh, 10 years ago now. I think so, yeah, about a decade ago then, <laughs> around our shared interest of money issues, money psychology, women and money, couples and money, and we've just kept up our friendship and collegial relationship over the years. So I'm just delighted to have you here today, Kathleen. I am thrilled to be here and to break money silence with you and have this <laughs> conversation. I think it will be fun to revisit it and I still remember sitting in that restaurant in Boston the first time I met you. So I'm glad our lives have stayed connected. Me too. And I remember that lunch too. I'm just picturing it right now on this (laughs) snowy day here. (laughs) So why don't we start with you just telling us about what got you interested in women and working with women and couples and money issues. Let's just start with that broad topic and then we'll zero into money taboos. Sure. If you look back over the course of my career, while it might not be evident in some of the career choices I made initially, I've always been interested in empowering women and helping people communicate or find their voice and communicate what they need to communicate. And so for the first part of my career, I did that in banking and finance, and then I switched to counseling psychology and really wanted to do that in a more, in my opinion, a more in-depth way, one-on-one. And then around 2008, 2009, I decided that I wanted to switch things up. And I started to form my company, KBK Wealth Connection. And that company and the work that I do now really takes everything that I love about banking and finance and everything I loved about psychology and combined it together. And so the focus of my firm is to write, speak, educate clients and the financial advisors and and advisors, so I use the term advisors broadly, about how can we do a better job in working 
it started off around women and wealth because I had a specialty in that area, but it's broadened out to talking about couples. And this gets a little bit into kind of your specialty and also adult children talking to their families. And so my latest work is called Breaking Money Silence. And it's really the culmination of all the things that I think and believe are important for individuals, women and couples to know, and then also for advisors who serve them to be working on with them. So I just feel very honored to be able to continue to empower myself and empower the people around me to just do a better job and be more financially savvy. It's so great to hear. And I must say, it's just wonderful. I just feel like you and I share it too. We're so lucky that we can combine the different interests we have and make it work and reach people and empower people. And so I just, I think it's wonderful that you've kind of developed in the ways you have and are sharing all the wealth that you've shared in helping people talk about money and get more comfortable with money. So tell us a little about, if you would, the current book. I know I share your sense that Money is a big taboo, and I always say money, sex, and death. And it's interesting because you say in your book it's even more than sex and death. So maybe talk a little about that. (laughs) I feel very fortunate to do the work I'm doing as well. So in the book, one of the statistics that I share is 44% of Americans find it more uncomfortable to talk about personal finance than religion, politics, or death. And I found that really startling. It was confirming something that I thought I knew, but I didn't realize that the numbers were so high. And most of the people on your teleseminar probably are aware that when we don't talk about a lot of things, but in this case, when we don't talk about money, we become as sick as our secrets. And so if you look at the impact of people not feeling comfortable talking around, talking openly and honestly around personal finance, 50% of marriages end in divorce with financial conflict often citing a, cited as a leading cause. 69% of parents, this is an interesting stat, feel more comfortable talking with their teens about sex than investing. And I think that really contributes to the financial literacy crisis that we have in our country, where not only are we not a very financially literate country in general, whether you're a man or a woman, but we don't necessarily have the skills to pass it on to the next generation, which is quite concerning. And then when it comes to talking to our aging parents about money, 54% of adult children said they'd rather talk to their teens about sex than they'd want to talk to their kids, their parents about aging. So I think there's a variety of ways across generations that not talking about money really negatively impacts us. And I have always been somebody, for better or worse, depending on your perspective, who has been about labeling the elephant in the room. And so I was like, I don't, this does not make sense to me. I certainly have been a victim of it and learned to talk about money myself with my partner and my parents and people around me. But I really thought, boy, if we can talk about all these other things, and certainly we're talking about politics and religion and race, sexism, why is it that we can't talk about money? And that's where the idea for the book came. And I realized there are other people like yourself, Dory, who are doing great work in this area, but we need a greater push and a greater understanding of this isn't just a nice thing to do. It's actually a crisis in our country that we're not doing it. And it's leading us to not be financially fit and savvy. And it concerned me. So that's where the idea came for the book. I think you're so right. And I do remember that lunch that we had and we connected around that because both of us tend to be the people who believe in talking about it. And it's what is it that makes it so hard? So can you, what do you think it is that makes it so hard for people to talk about money and even I think people think about it themselves and there are a lot of issues and feelings they have and I know it's related to this mindset that you talk about. So maybe you can share a little about what is it about money that makes it such a struggle for both individuals and then when you're in a relationship, in a relationship or with your parents or your children. Sure. It's complicated. So this is going to be a high level. But I think there's a couple of things that come into play. One is if you look back historically over time, and I'm talking going back centuries, part of not talking about if you had money, so if you were affluent, if you were king or queen, the reason you didn't want to talk about the money or the gold that you had or the territory that you had, and you didn't want your kids to do that either, was it actually helped you stay secure. It was a way of protecting your wealth and your land. And so if we don't talk about it, people won't know how much we have and they won't pillage our kingdom. You flash forward to century, flash forward to now, and a lot of affluent families still aren't talking about money. That legacy in some ways has been passed on that we just don't talk about it. It's rude. It's unnecessary. 
And the problem is nowadays, if affluent families and even non-affluent families, but if affluent families don't talk about money and teach their kids not only financial literacy, but also some insight into their relationship with money and what it means to be affluent, that then they fail to actually do what they want to do, which is keep the wealth in the family. One statistic that a lot of people have probably heard is 70% of families fail to pass down wealth to future generations. And about 60% of that is due to the fact that there's a discomfort in the family and in talking about finances. So what started off as something that was very protective has ended up being something that's harmful. And I feel like we haven't caught up in our society in terms of what can we do about it? How do we teach these skills? Because we don't, and this is in general, but in general, we don't teach them in our families. We don't teach them in our schools. And often people in the finance world, whether it's banking, finance, whatever part of finance you're in, have often been indoctrinated into a culture that says talking about feelings is not part of our business. That's for somebody else. And so there's just this collusion that happens for us all to remain quiet. I also think when we start to speak up or when we think about talking about money, whether this is to our partner or a friend or a parent, there's such complicated feelings around it. You think about it, money is actually a tool to exchange goods and services. But boy, it's a lot more than that. It's a lot of people feel all sorts of feelings about it. And I believe that there's a lot of money shame out there people feeling as if I don't do money right, I don't understand money, I'm not good at it. And because we're not talking about it, we don't learn that, oh, by the way, the person sitting next to me also feels uncomfortable with their relationship with money. And so that money shame leads us to not open up and not realize, wow, we're all in this together. And what I find is when I coach somebody or when I train advisors or bankers to be able to empower their clients to engage in these conversations, that once you break through that initial uncomfortableness, with a little bit of practice, it's like any skill. You can build up that muscle. And dare I say, it's going to be sound crazy for some people, <laughs> but talking about money with your partner or your loved ones actually can be fun. It doesn't have to be this really uncomfortable thing. Sometimes there's uncomfortable conversations that need to happen. Yes, but there's a variety of ways in which you can create that conversation that I think is more fun and more useful. And that's where we get into kind of the money mindset. But before I even talk about that, Dory, I want to go back to something you taught me that you probably don't know that you taught me was early on in our conversations about couples and money. One of the things that you offered, and I don't know whether we were doing a podcast together or just having a casual conversation, is the idea that if couples start talking about the successes or one financial success that they've had and what that means, that it starts the conversation off in a different way. That instead of talking about what you did wrong, partner, you blew it, or I'm terrible around money, you focus on what's gone right. And I've always used that tip and tool and carried it forward because I think it's a great way to start a more positive financial conversation. That's so really good to hear. And I, too, I really still believe that if you start with things that you've succeeded at or things that you have some agreement on, it it really helps. And I wanted to add to what you were saying that it's not just having fun in the conversation, which I know seems an oxymoron to talk about money and have fun, but it actually can help bring you closer together because so often the divisiveness is the fear of what's going to happen if we talk about it. And if you discover that there are really ways to talk about it, you actually feel closer with each other and feel safer with each other. So I just wanted to add that. No, that that's very important because there there's actually research too that supports that. And yeah. certainly your experience working with couples, my experience, but there's also research that says that couples that talk about money regularly report a greater satisfaction in their relationship in general. And it's something that initially we think, ooh, it's going to push that person away or we're going to fight, but you're right. It actually, over time, helps you understand where your partner's coming from. And we do that in a variety of other ways in different areas of our lives. And so why not do it around how they think and feel about finance? Absolutely. And I just want to remind listeners, just in case you came on late, this is a pre-recorded call this time with Kathleen, but you still can ask questions and I encourage you to. So go to the event page and submit your questions, your comments. And after the call, I will be submitting the questions to Kathleen who will respond to them and then we'll get the responses out to everybody so that you'll have a chance to hear the responses to your specific questions. So I just want to remind you to to please do that. So let's get back a little more to this mindset because, and I did want to say, and I know you commented on it, that 
although a lot of your work is with the wealthy people and affluence and wealth management, so much of this pertains no matter how much or how little money you have because money just for all of us can be complicated. And there's shame, as you said. And when you think about all these little things like money's dirty, money's bad, you don't talk about all these admonitions that that we grow up with. So maybe you can talk more about the mindset of money and how it's, I mean, you've started on it, but how it's developed and how it can both be good and also get in our way. And is it modifiable? And just a little more about this whole mindset thing. Sure. I also just want to address one thing is that certainly when I started out in this field, I worked with more affluent families and advisors who served affluent clients. Over time, what I've found is that a lot of these tools and the money mindset tool I'll talk about in a minute do apply to people of all different socioeconomic statuses and backgrounds. And so just to be clear, and you probably may not even know this story, but I work with a variety of people now and I tend to do the train the trainer, but I'm very open to training anyone who is in this realm around money. So it doesn't have to be, and certainly the Breaking Money Silence book does not have to be uh, around somebody who has a certain amount of investable assets. So I just want to be clear, that has shifted and changed over my career. And I actually, I think that's great that it can apply to all of us. And there's certainly special Mm -hmm. factors for different types of levels of wealth. But the money talk, I talk about a mindset. And in the book, I talk about the money talk mindset. So As we know, everybody has automatic thoughts and beliefs about money and finance and its purpose in the world. And we have these thoughts and beliefs, but often we're not, they're not in our conscious thought or we haven't spent a lot of time thinking about them. And so I call it a money mindset. And that's a term that's certainly used in the wealth psychology field or financial psychology field. And so a money mindset is how you automatically think and feel about money. And then those automatic thoughts and beliefs impact your saving, investing, spending, and gifting behaviors, whether you're aware of it or not. So one of the first things that I tend to encourage people to do, whether you are a professional or whether you are somebody who is working with a professional, is to sit down and get a sense of what are my automatic thoughts and beliefs about money and how do they impact my behaviors? Because one of the things that's really powerful is once you identify how you're thinking about money, you can decide if you want to keep that thought or if you want to shift that thought. But let me just go back a little bit. A money mindset typically is formed between the ages of 5 and 15. So when we start to become aware as little kids that money is such a thing, we look around our environment and we go, oh, mom and dad or our grandma and grandpa or, or my big aunt and uncle are doing certain behaviors. They're either talking about money or they're not talking about money. They're arguing about money or they're engaged in a conversation or they're silent. And so we gather all that data And we form different thoughts and beliefs that then add up to be your money mindset. And so after 15, they tend to be, it tends to settle. But if you become aware of it and you bring these thoughts and beliefs into your conscious awareness, you can then decide how you want to interact with money, what type of relationship you want to have, and you can change these beliefs. It's probably part of the work that you do, Dory, and certainly is part of the work that I encourage everybody to do because it really can be quite enlightening and you can understand, oh, why is it that I interact this way with money? Why is it that I feel guilty every time I spend money? Or why is it that I have trouble keeping money in my pocket? It often goes back to your money mindset. And so because Breaking Money Silence is specifically around financial communication, I took a subset of that and I identify or have an exercise in the book. And when I speak, I talk about this a lot is what is your money talk mindset? So, yes, we have automatic thoughts and beliefs about money itself, but we also have these attitudes about engaging in a financial conversation. So I have people complete, in the book it's more, but certainly when I'm presenting, it's five different statements. And let me just review them quickly with you so people who are listening in can get an idea of what I'm talking about. So I would just have somebody complete uh, these statements with whatever comes to mind and there's no right or wrong answer. So the statements are things like, talking about money with my loved ones is. Talking to my parents about money is. The financial topic I find most difficult to discuss is. The financial topic I find the easiest to discuss is. And the biggest fear I have when it comes to money talk is. Now, certainly I would do that much slower and give you a little bit more time if we were indeed in a training, but it gives you a sense of what automatically comes to mind. 
So if you think talking to my parents about money is scary and uncomfortable, that is a mindset that's going to present some roadblocks when and if you get to the time where you have to talk to mom and dad about helping them with their finances or estate planning as they age. If you think talking to my parents about money is enlightening, then that conversation it may still be challenging, but it's not going to be as anxiety provoking. So it's tapping into what our automatic thoughts are and then looking at how we can shift, how we can change them and certainly how we can keep some because some of them serve us and some of us, some of them just happen to get in the way. And so you get to decide as an adult which thoughts and beliefs are going to work for you. I think that's a wonderful exercise for people to have. And it's so true because if you bring it into consciousness, you realize you have choices and otherwise Often it just becomes this slippery slope and it's this self-fulfilling prophecy that you just go down that route because that's just the automatic way to do it. Yeah, and I think I call it, sorry, Dory, I call it like turning up the volume. If you didn't want to do the exercise, one of the things is go through a day and every time you spend money or every time you interact with finance or money at all, just say, oh, what am I thinking right now? And so you turn up the volume on that self-talk and Boy, we can discover a lot of things about ourselves, and you're right. It, then you feel more empowered and controlled because it's not this mysterious thing that's happening. It's, oh, it's happening. And over time, if I want to change it, I can. Or if I don't want to change it, then you're at least empowered to decide, you know what, I'm not going to take action, and that's okay too. No, absolutely. I think this is its terrific, and I hope everybody's thinking about these things. And I do want to encourage you, and I know we'll talk more at the end about how to get Kathleen's book, but it's a really helpful book and helpful concepts to think about. So with this money mindset, do you find are there differences between men and women? Are there gender differences that you've been finding? That's a great question. I'm actually in the process of doing some initial research on all the breaking money silence concepts in terms of how it affects the clients as well as advisors. That research is at very early stages. But with that said, I don't necessarily see a gender difference between somebody's money talk mindset in general when it comes to men and women. Now, once again, this is not based on any hard, fast data. Where I do see a difference and where I do think women typically struggle more, and I think it's even more paramount that women speak up, break their silence, and take care of themselves, tends to be around the world of work and negotiation. If we think about gender parity, or we think about female entrepreneurs and how they approach their business, or even the fact that as a consumer, you walk into a store and you may not know that you're paying what's called a pink tax, which is sometimes the exact same product that's marketed to a woman costs more than one that would be marketed to a man. So this financial discrimination that's out there that is hurting women is even more of a reason why women need to start these conversations and figure out what is my money talk mindset and how do I advocate for myself? I'll give you a great example that was just in the news. If you haven't heard, and I forget the name of the movie, so maybe you'll know Dory, but it's Michelle Williams and Mark Wahlberg are two of the actors, and they had to reshoot some scenes because Kev Kevin Spacey right. was let go from the film. And so he was replaced yeah, about by Getty, uh, the Getty film. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. what's interesting to me is what's been all over social media and the TV is that Michelle Williams was paid $1,000 to reshoot the scenes and Mark Wahlberg was paid 1.5 million. Now, on the surface, you're like, wow, that's huge. And it is huge. But, and once again, I wasn't there. I obviously don't know these stars. <clears throat> but what I can get from what I've read is Mark Wahlberg refused to shoot the scenes unless he was paid his regular fee. Whereas Michelle Williams said, yeah, I'll help out because it's for a good cause. Now, Whatever you think about those two things, that's the gender difference when it comes to advocating for ourselves financially. And so what's so wonderful, and I want to give Mark Wahlberg kudos here, is he just donated that $1.5 million to the Time's Up legal campaign because he mm. seems to be a guy who's supportive of ending the inequality around gender. But that's where I think financial conversations and talking about money for women is something that obviously I feel very passionate about. And I think it it needs to, we need to support each other in doing that. And, it, and we need to become more comfortable saying, I deserve a certain amount. And that's not because I'm not a nice person. And that's not anything other than I need to take care of myself. And that's what a business person would do. In fact, the other day, just last week, I was asked to speak for free, which 
and I found out that other people, some of the men, most of the men, were being paid a large sum to speak mm. at the same conference. So it was hard, but I had to practice what mm. I preached. And I had to say, here's my fee, and I would love to work with you, but I need to do what I'm encouraging all the women and men in my life to do, which is ask for what I'm worth. So we'll see what they come back with. I would hope that they would do what was right. I also know that they may make a different choice, and that's okay as well. But those are examples mm. of how I see gender differences when it comes to money talk. It tends to be around taking care of yourself financially in those ways. And it's been such a long running for women not to do that. So it's you're walking the talk, as they say. And it's not and comfortable. Think, yeah, I'd love no. to say, oh, I did it and it was easy. It's yeah. like I slept on it. I thought yeah. about it. And then I thought, I'd love to help out. I love this particular organization, but I have to practice what I preach. No, I think it's a good role model for all of us, and I think it's important to keep in mind that and each little step, each little opportunity that we have, it's a really good example that one can make a choice. You speak up or you don't speak up. And So what do you think makes it easier? What Do men really know more about money? What you know? I, 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 think, that, I think I know your answer on it. And I, can you speak about that a little? <laughs> sure. One of the chapters in the book is called All Men Are Financially Literate and Other Myths About about gender and money. And so the myth about gender and money, it, to simplify it, it's like uh, literally men know finances, men are interested in investments, and women were just not that good at it, or we just don't want to worry our pretty little heads about it. And we all know that life is much more complicated than that. And so what ends up happening for women is there's this assumption that you're not interested in finance. There's an assumption that you're not good at it. And some women buy into it and in some way kind of use that as, and I'm going to use a strong word, but an excuse to not take care of yourself financially. And that has some serious ramifications for women. We tend to live longer. We tend to save less for retirement. And we tend to not get paid as much. And so to then put on top of all of that, not speaking up and taking care of yourself financially, that's not good. And so that impacts the, the the individual woman. It also impacts the relationship between the advisor and a female client. But the same thing happens with men. And I don't think we talk about it much. And that's start, I've started to really highlight that, that this idea that men have it all together financially is also a myth. And it, it does a disservice to men. So one of the things that can happen, and I'll use the sitting with your financial advisor or your banker is the banker or advisor assumes that he knows what he's talking about. And so because men are socialized to not show their vulnerability, to act as if, and because there's a strong cultural message that men are providers and they should know how to manage money, that often men don't speak up and say, you know what, I need help in this area. Or maybe you need to explain that to me again. Not all men, but a lot of men, there's pressure to act as if. So in the advising meeting, you know, men go and, act, and they don't get what they need because of these myths. And I feel like then women actually are in some ways talked down to or misunderstood because of these myths. And so the reality is we need to, all of us, check our assumptions at the door, which is easier said than done. We all have gender bias. But notice when it's happening and then start to question ourselves about how can we meet this other person that we're engaged in with a financial conversation with, how can we meet them where they're at? How can we, if we have assumptions, how can we ask curious questions and just check out those assumptions? Honest, and I encourage a lot of people who work with clients around money to, to ask a simple question on a scale of one to five, five being the most, you know, what, how would you rate your financial literacy? How would you rate your financial confidence, which is your ability or comfort level in using that financial literacy to make financial decisions? And then once they give a rating, ask them why that rating is and ask them what would increase that rating versus what would decrease that rating. It's a very quick litmus test. But instead of saying, oh, she's a three and he's probably a five, find out because it could be she's a five and he's a three. So it's just checking the assumptions at the door, which we all do it, I understand. But it's really helped to not buy into those gender myths because they're hurting all of us, not just women. I think it's so true. And I've seen many times that just using the women the gender issue for an, another moment or so that many women seem pretty financially savvy when they're on their own. And then it's amazing what happens often when they get into a relationship. And again, it's a stereotype because they're shifting now. But, you know, many women that I've seen and couples that I've seen have said, I really handled my finances well when I was by myself. It's a shambles now and I can't talk up and, and I feel we're, we're not 
understanding each other and we're not able to talk about it and but I don't think he knows what he's doing and and some men in sessions I've had admit that they're just sort of going by the seat of their pants and they're just kind of just as you say the as if because that's the expectation they're supposed to understand it and that doesn't serve us well if we keep operating in those as if ways and what you're highlighting I think is really important and it's generational but I also don't think the younger generation is doing as great a job as we would like to believe they are where women do often relinquish our power when we get into the relationship and in different ways we do that and it's being aware that this is an area of your life just like good nutrition, taking care of yourself from a health standpoint, it's also taking care of yourself financially. And so if you notice that tendency in yourself, it's figuring that out and figuring out how to work with your partner around not doing that or at least understanding why it's happening. And what I find interesting is that when men are the primary breadwinners in the family, they tend to make more unilateral decisions around money. And when the women are the primary breadwinners, they tend to collaborate more around the financial decisions, even though they might have the power. So that also speaks to a gender difference. But I also think there's a cultural piece to this where there's a lot of pressure for women to not appear too financially put together because in some ways, and this is sad, but in some ways it's seen as unattractive. And we need to get over that as a society, that financial literacy should be attractive on anybody. Agreed, agreed. And what about the situation in couples where it's not unusual that one person tends to handle the finances more? And I know you have some really good observations and opinions about that. So maybe you could share about if if one manages, should that one continue? Should the other person be involved? What's your thinking on that? My thinking is probably pretty in line, Dory, with what you think, is that dividing and conquering as a couple is part of what you do. It's one of the advantages of couplehood. You don't need to both take out the trash, (laughs) thank goodness, because that's not my task. But you do need to be involved, to use the trash analogy. If your partner's on business travel or on vacation, you need to know what day the trash goes out. You need to know the basics of it. And so it's very similar around finance is that, okay, one of you might be more inclined financially or more interested, or maybe that's just a task that fell into that person's lap when you first got together. And so there's nothing wrong with that, the divide and conquer. But what I encourage people to do is for the person who is the non financially dominant spouse. So the one that tends to not be doing the bills or on a regular basis meeting with the advisor, I encourage you to figure out a way to get involved. And so one of the things that I think is pretty easy to do is have a financial meeting. And these meetings can be 15, 20, 30 minutes. They shouldn't be really long, but a time in the course of a month or depending on the frequency that's going to work in your couple to say, What's going on financially? What's going out? What's coming in? And is there anything that we need to be deciding as a couple? And so that communication piece can be really important. If you are working with a wealth manager, a financial advisor, and you both aren't going to the meetings, I encourage you to reconsider that. You may feel like it's a waste of time to be in the meeting, especially if you're not the financially dominant one, but it is not. Your perspective is really vital because money is real and how you invest money and spend money and plan for retirement is really about your values, your life perspective, you know, what's important to you and your part of that vision should not be left out of that meeting. And also you can get a sense of, am I working or is my partner working with someone that I feel comfortable with? Because the reality, which is sad, nobody likes to think about this, at some point there's just going to be one of you. And statistically, it could be the female. That isn't always the case. But both of you need to have a good working relationship with that particular advisor or that particular wealth manager. And I also think, so meetings on a regular basis, working with a financial advisor, if at all possible. And if you really struggle around something like this, work with somebody like you, Dory. There's other people out there, too, who do this type of couple's money psychology work in just identifying what makes this a difficult conversation. How can we set it up in a way where we're both being taken care of? Because sometimes it just needs you just need an outside party to help you figure out how to do it as a couple. Now, the last thing I'll say before I go back to you, Dory, is just if you are in a partnership right now, whether you are and you're starting dating or you're getting serious or maybe this is your second relationship or potentially your second or third marriage, take time and to talk about money up front. Often we talk about prenuptial agreements and there's some legal reasons why you want to have a prenuptial agreement in certain situations. But I feel like no matter what 
your asset level or what your income level, you should definitely have a premarital conversation. And that's just figuring out. Talk about your money mindset. Talk about your money talk mindset. And then develop a plan as a couple around how are we going to do this thing called money. And if your marriage is good, you're going to be together a number of years. So you can just design a plan for a year and then decide how it's going to work for you guys and then revisit it. I know couples who it's always the same person who pays the bill. I also know couples who after five years, they switch those responsibilities. It, you can make it up to work for your couplehood, but it is an important thing to be managing together, discussing together, and figuring out as a couple, how can we be the healthiest we can be around money? Because to get back to your point earlier in the call, that's going to help your intimacy level, your relationship. It has ramifications well beyond your bank account. It's so true. It's interesting. There was just a recent article in the New York Times saying everybody works on the engagement and the planning weddings and when people don't always talk about how to have conversations, how to talk together, how to problem solve together. And it's about money, but it's also more than money. But just what comes next after the big party? kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I was exactly the same. I was the financially, I had been a banker or been an auditor for banks and we got engaged. And the first thing I did was I went, I, well, after telling both the parents and being relieved, <laughs> like, oh, this guy isn't going to, he's staying around. That's positive because I want him to stay around. I literally took him to the bank and he wasn't very good with money. So I took control of all of the money. This was all like, obviously I was conscious while I was doing this, but it was unconscious as to what that meant. And so I did that for about 10 years and then ended up really resentful. Like, why am I doing all the finances? And I realized I had set that up. So it wasn't until we had a particularly difficult financial period in our lives where we reevaluated that and now do things differently. Do I, am I still the lead on the finances? Yes, I happen to have the financial background, but He's in it with me. We meet with the advisor together. We One of the easy ways to talk about money each month is we get our LL Bean credit card and we go through it, not Ed with a fine tooth comb, but in general, and talk about the what flowed out and what, where that number is. And it's just a way of connecting and then moving on. And I no longer feel resentful. And prize, my husband actually is pretty good at finance if I let him do something. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful example. <laughs> what yes, an example. Yeah. So what recommendations do you have about how to start? You took the bull by the horns, as they say, and did it. But what like, what are ways that people can start the conversation, whether it be with a partner or also now that we're living longer? And I know some people on the call have parents as well as adult children and or partners or siblings. How do you recommend that people start these conversations? I really believe, first of all, you can use listening into this particular teleseminar as an excuse, right? I was listening to this teleseminar right. about breaking yeah. my silence and you know, what do you think of this? So then you start to engage in a financial conversation mm-hmm. based on having listened to Dory's podcast or her teleseminar. But I think it's thinking through who do you want to talk to? Why does it feel important to talk to them? And then how do you best go about it? So one of the things that I find, and maybe this is just my experience, but I find that we don't prep because we're anxious about financial conversations. We tend to blurt them out. We tend to ask at times that may not be ideal, like at big family dinners or during an argument. And so really taking a step back and going, who would I like to talk to about finances and what is my main objective? So we'll use an example of you want to talk to your elderly parent or your aging parents about money because you're concerned that maybe they're not cognitively as sharp as they used to be. And so one of the things to think about is how do you extend a loving invitation? How do you be respectful that if you're inviting someone to have a conversation around money, that you may have thought about it for weeks or months or at least hours, and you're asking them to break a taboo, and they've probably had no notice. So thinking about what's the most gentle way that you can approach them and how do you give them some sense of control over the conversation. So I know one of the interviews in the book is with a colleague of mine, Kelly, and her dad had some health issues. And after he had been put in the hospital and then released, she started to wonder about her parents' finances because he was on the younger side of aging, so to speak. I think he was in his late 60s or mid-60s, so pretty young in my opinion. And so she said she took, she approached him by himself. 
She said, it's because I care, Dad. I really just want to make sure that I know what's going on so I can be most helpful. And then gave him some time to think about it. Why don't you think about it? And then next Sunday when I'm over for dinner, we can revisit it. So she extended it with a kind, caring heart. She gave her dad some room to breathe and decide if he wanted to engage in that conversation. And then when he, because he was a proud man, then when he agreed that he would let her help, she made sure she did it in bite-sized pieces. That instead of asking for all his financial information, everything all at once, what she'd do is every Sunday she'd go over and she'd be like, Dad, do you have medical, your medical ID numbers? Maybe you could just get that for me. And they literally did it in these bite-sized pieces that were manageable for her father. It's really thinking about how do you individualize? How do you use a situation that's a teachable moment? Certainly a health crisis is one of them. It doesn't have to be, and ideally it would be great if it wasn't. That's where a teachable moment could be sharing this recording with a loved one and saying, I'd like to engage in a conversation. Why don't you listen to this and we'll talk about this tel teleseminar. And then you want to make sure that you give yourself a reward. It's not easy to break this taboo. And so think about how can you pat yourself on the back or know that even if it doesn't go perfectly, or maybe that person that you want to talk about finance with, they don't say yes right away, that at least you've done your part and you've spoken up. And it often takes a series of invitations before someone's willing to go down that path with you. Although I have had, I've had heard a fair amount of stories of an adult child who's really worried about talking to mom and dad, like they're going to be offended or they're going to think I'm greedy. And what has ended up happening is once they got the courage to broach the conversation, the parent was actually relieved that it had been on their mind as well. So you just never know till you ask if someone's going to engage in this conversation. I've seen that so much too. And I think it's a great idea. I've heard it both ways where sometimes the adult the parent says, I want to talk about it. And then he say, my adult children say, I don't want to talk about it. You're, you're going to live forever. It's going to be fine. And, <laughs> or the other way around, which is, what do you want me dead? I, you're just talking because you want my money. Or Generally, there's such a relief. And it's the talking about money, but it's also a wonderful time to talk about end of life issues and wishes if you haven't already. And they're just such important conversations to do when it's not a time of crisis. I just want to reiterate uh, yeah. what you were saying. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's ideal. Yeah. There's a a very right. high percentage yeah. of people who wait. And so yeah. if you right. are in that boat, go for it. But the other thing is, it's interesting because I had somebody tell me a story about her mother who was 79, had read something in the New York Times, came in, there was a lunch for mom and the two daughters. And one daughter's a counselor, one daughter's in health and wellness in a different capacity. And so mom comes in with a big box of receipts, plops it on the counter and says, I just read an article in the New York Times. I need to talk to you girls about money. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, what was well, really great, fascinating well. and what I'm what I want to highlight here is the dynamic. So mom comes barging mm -hmm. in, the daughter who is the counselor, who you would think would be the one that would be like, oh, thank goodness we're going to have this conversation, really initially could not tolerate engaging this conversation with her mom. It was just too much. She had to actually excuse herself from the room because she was so upset. And the other sibling who tends to health and wellness, but not really the, finan the most financially literate of the two, was the one who could engage with mom. And so mom went through the box and she took notes and and eventually her sister came along, but it wasn't the sister that you would have thought. And so you just have to give yourself a little space, a little breathing room, and understand that sometimes there's different dynamics with your siblings, and not everybody's going to be in the same place at the same time. And that's really hard, but try to be compassionate to yourself and the other people in your family. That's really good advice. And again, I just want to remind people this is a pre-recorded call. Please submit your questions, comments, and we'll be getting them to Kathleen after the call is broadcast and she'll respond to them. So I just want to encourage you so that you're able to really know that some of your own questions are going to be able to get responded to. I just wanted to go back for a minute of when you said about give yourself a reward after you've done these difficult things. What I actually have clients do is take their right hand and pat themselves on the you know, <laughs> I love that. shoulder. I love that. Yeah. Or I guess if you're left-handed, it can be the other way around. But just it's like taking a moment to just pause and say, Phew, that that was good, and I want to I want to acknowledge that to myself. And I think we don't do that enough for ourselves. I even what a pairing, right? 
<laughs> yeah. It's like carrying yeah. a positive experience with something that we often associate with a negative experience. So it could be a hug. I know for my husband and I, we love the great outdoors, so it may be a walk uh-huh. when we're done. You no, know, it could be a variety of different things. In fact, I actually interviewed a woman who's very well known in the divorce financial advice. Stacy Francis. And she said that when her and her husband have a financial meeting together, the reward is she sits at a desk and he, and it has all the financial information out. He actually is a big cyclist. So he has his bike on a trainer. And during the 30 minutes that they're talking about money, he's getting in his workout. And she goes, it actually works because he gets his immediate reward. And she goes, my reward is that we've had the conversation. I thought, that is brilliant. Talk about multitasking at the nth degree. So I really like that. So you can be creative. Think about what's going to be a win-win for each of you. That's terrific. I I like that a lot. And I'm just constantly thinking as you're talking about, and it has to do with money and other kind of things too, but definitely about this money taboo that there are these stories we tell ourselves, i.e., you know, the money mindset as you talk about. And some of them are great, but some of them hinder us. And so it's become so important to look at what it is we're telling ourselves, what it, how we're working things, and to recognize there are other ways to do it so we can create new stories. And I really do think that's such a big part of what the underlying theme of breaking money silence is. It's find a, create a new story that works so you can talk about this, this important thing so it's not the elephant in the room. No, I love that way of thinking about it is, yeah, when we're, as adults, we're in charge of what kind of stories we want to tell ourselves. Yeah. And sometimes it's hard to let go of the old story, but often I find it's also very freeing. Right. Now, I know you have some kind of money talk guidelines. Do you 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 want to to mention a few of them? Great. Sure. There's a lot of different thoughts and beliefs about how to have a financial conversation. But one of the things that I have found really useful in working with clients and encouraging other people who are working with clients, or even just if you are a um, person who's going to use this in your own life, is to think about how can we set some guidelines, some rules around engaging in a financial conversation. And so in the book, they're called the Kingsbury Rules for Fighting Fair Financially. And so there's seven of them. And what I encourage, I'll go over them quickly, but what I encourage you to do is actually you can go to my Breaking Money Silence website, breakingmoneysilence.com, and if you sign up for, I believe it's my podcast, you'll get a version of these Money Talk guidelines. I also can figure out a way to get them to Dory so she can share them as well. And so basically, it's putting these guidelines in front of you and reminding everybody that these are the rules we're going to play by. So the first is to be respectful. And the reason you need to be respectful, we all want to be respectful, is but when we're talking talking about money or if you have some anxiety or some anger or some conflicting feelings, sometimes it's not always easy to be respectful. So respectful behaviors include listening carefully, not interrupting, which is a hard one for me personally, as you've already seen on this podcast, reframing from using profanity or blaming language. Now, most of us, when we're calm, would say, oh, of course. But when you get into a conversation about money, sometimes it gets hard. Next, you want to use I statements to communicate how you're feeling, and you want to make sure that then you're listening actively to your partner. It's really important to fight that urge of pointing a finger or blaming. A money conversation isn't about winning or losing. It's about mutual understanding. And so it may be, and this is rule six, that you need to agree to disagree. You may not be on the same page. But the goal is to really, where is my partner or my parent or my child coming from? And where am I coming from? Where are the similarities and where are the differences? And you need to really listen actively in order to be able to do that. So a great way to know that you're listening actively is if you are talking less and listening more and asking follow-up questions. And so the next two tips have to do with not reading minds. So you don't want to read minds. You don't want to make an assumption about what your partner is going to say or how they think. And the more you're with somebody, the, lo- not, the longer you have this history, the more there's a tendency to be like, oh, we've been here before. I know what you think. And you have to fight that urge. And the best way to fight that urge is to practice curiosity. So to be, get in the mindset of being curious and open and just wondering about the other person's experience. Even if you've been here before, each and every situation is different. 
And then, as we mentioned before, you want to give yourself a reward. You could use the Dory pat on the back. I love that because it's instantaneous. It doesn't cost any money. You can also think about something that's a little bit more elaborate, like what Stacey Francis and her husband does, or thinking you know, about other things that might work for your couplehood. So to just summarize, the steps are be respectful, use I statements, listen actively, don't mind read, practice curiosity, agree to disagree, and then give yourself a reward for breaking money silence. And over time, you will get better and better at following these guidelines and feel more comfortable in your financial conversations. Great. Thanks. And why don't you tell people more about how to get your book? So why don't you mention that and your website? And I would love to. So Great. the book, the website for the book is breakingmoneysilence.com. If you go there, you can see a little bit more about the book. You can pick up some free tip sheets, things like that. There is also the easiest way to get the book, to be honest with you, is to go to Amazon and order it there. I have an author's page and you just type in Breaking Money Silence or my name, Kathleen Burns Kingsbury, and it will come up. This episode happy that you've been able to be with us today, Kathleen. And Me too. I want to encourage people to read the book. And I still have one last question for you before sure. we finish up today. But I want to encourage people to read the book. It's really a very helpful book. And it's organized in some really great ways because there's the content of which you already see that there's some wonderful content that Lean offers. And then there's some kind of challenges at the end, summary and challenges. And then she also has a little section at the end that's helpful advice for advisors or when people can think about advisors in many different ways, helpful for coaches as well as helpful for talking with whomever you want to talk about and whatever your age. That's the other part that's part of this book, whether you be in the second half of life, as many of you are who are listening or a millennial. This book is a really helpful one to really try to help people open to talking more about money issues. So I've just been delighted to have you here. And maybe as we end, if you could just do uh, your last kind of takeaway of what would you like people to take away from listening to this interview as well as the ideas that are part of your book? Sure. You know, what I would love is for each and every person who's listening in to consider joining what I call the Breaking Money Silence Revolution. Because I think we're in a moment of time where there's a lot of silence being broken in our culture. And if we also break our silence around finance, we can be healthier, both individually as well as in our partnerships and in our families. And there's a variety of ways in which you can join the Breaking Money Silence Revolution. One is certainly checking out the book, sharing it with other people, doing the activities in the book, sharing it with your financial advisor, or if you're an advisor, sharing it with your clients. But I truly believe in that if each and every one of us take the risk to engage in one money conversation and see how it goes, that what we'll find over time is that eventually – This taboo against talking about money will no longer exist, and then we can be more financially healthy, and we also can have more satisfying relationships and take care of ourselves. And so that's my hope, is that each and every one of you will just consider how you can use some of what you learned today in order to join the revolution and just chip away at that money silence out there. Oh, that's a great challenge for all of us, and I hope that all of you listening will take up the challenge and that we can work toward that. I make a commitment. I feel like I've been making a commitment over time of trying to challenge that, and I think it's a wonderful revolution to join. So, Kathleen, thank you again so much for being with us. Take care. Have a great Great. rest of your day. I will do you too. Take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio with Dr. Dorian Mincer. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show, listen to past episodes, or download our free retirement transition guide, visit revolutionizeyourretirementradio.com.